Hello everybody, this is my presentation about HIV and its importance related to pregnancy. First of all, I'm going to give you an overview of the topic, an estimated prevalence of the virus in the United Kingdom. I'm going to talk about mother-to-child transmission, the effects of HIV on pregnancy and vice versa, medication and care management throughout pregnancy. Starting explaining what HIV is, we need to know it stands for the Human Immunodeficiency Virus. It first emerged 30 years ago and attacks the body's immune system, leading to a progressive reduction in the number of T cells expressing CD4. This virus only affects human beings, and there are over 35 million people living with HIV worldwide, of which 25 million people live in the Sub-Saharan Africa, the continent most deeply affected. On the other hand, AIDS stands for the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. A person is considered to have AIDS when the immune system has become so weak that it can no longer fight off a wide range of diseases with which it will normally cope. HIV is considered a disability under the Equality Act 2010 and this means discrimination on the basis of someone's HIV status is illegal. HIV is passed on from one person to another via body fluids, blood, semen, pre-ejaculate, vaginal fluids and breast milk. In the UK today, the main routes of transmission are through vaginal or anal sex without a condom, by sharing injecting equipment or needles for injecting drugs or tattooing, and less commonly, HIV is passed on through oral sex, mother to baby transmission, although with the right medical interventions, there is less than one in 10 chance of this happening. Finally, it's passed through breast milk. Now, I'm going to speak about the prevalence of the virus in the United Kingdom. In 2013, there are over 100,000 people living with HIV in the UK. Approximately 1 in 4 people in the UK who are living with the virus don't know that they have got it. In the UK, an estimated of 20,000 children live in a family affected by the HIV. The number of HIV tests performing sexual health services increased dramatically in 2012. In 2012, less than 1% of people with HIV died. Because of effective treatments, most people living with HIV in the UK will not go on to develop AIDS. Linking HIV and women, it's important to know that over half of people living with HIV are women. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 60% of the 25 million HIV-infected adults are women. And the number of HIV-infected females continues to rise, with the greatest increases in Eastern Europe, Asia and Latin America. The groups most affected by HIV in the UK are 42% gay and bisexual men, 35% black African women and men, many of whom are migrants, 3% black Caribbean men and women, prisoners, are disproportionately affected by both HIV and hepatitis B and C. Finally, around 2% of the population suffering from HIV are injecting drug users. It's important for us as midwives to keep in mind when offering sexual health education that the primary mode of transmission among women is heterosexual transmission. Now, focusing on pregnancy, our main objectives when facing this condition will be the prevention of mother-to-child transmission and the evaluation and treatment on HIV in infected women. Mother-to-child transmission may occur in utero, during delivery, or after birth through breastfeeding. In the absence of breastfeeding, around 65% of vertically infected infants acquire the infection during birth, and approximately 35% are infected late in utero. 
fewer than 2% are infected in the early and middle stages of pregnancy. Currently, about 2% of all HIV-exposed infants are vertically infected. Factors associated with mother-to-child transmissions are maternal, obstetric, and fetal. The two most important ones are maternal viral load and antiretroviral therapy used during pregnancy. Some of the other factors could be advanced HIV disease, poor maternal nutrition, smoking, prolonged rupture of membranes, root of delivery, prematurity, and genetic susceptibility. Now, we will move on to the effect of HIV infection on pregnancy outcome. Certain infections may be linked to a spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, intrauterine growth retardation, preterm delivery, and low birth weight. An event that occurs more frequently in HIV-positive women when compared with HIV-uninfected women. Chorioamnonitis is one of them. It's the inflammation of the chorion and the amnion, and it's usually associated with a bacterial infection. It could result in risks for mother and baby, as it may lead to premature rupture of membranes with the possibility of premature birth. Chorioamnionitis, prolonged rupture of membranes and premature birth have all been associated with mother-to-child transmission of HIV and may be interlinked. Although this is frequently associated with advanced untreated HIV disease. Now we are going to talk about the effect of pregnancy on HIV progression. Concern that pregnancy can accelerate the progression of HIV infection was triggered by early case reports of HIV infected women during pregnancy. However, these reports were subject to selection bias towards women with severe immunosuppression. Data from New York and Europe suggest that in women without advanced HIV disease, there is no increased risk of accelerated immunosuppression in pregnancy. It's important to know as well that women not infected with HIV, it means with a normal pregnancy, they also show a reduction in CD40 cell subset during pregnancy. So percentages of CD4 and CD8 T cells remain stable throughout pregnancy and up to six months after birth. I've considered important to include a section about medication. It may sound a bit complicated, but it constitutes one of the basic aspects to get an optimal pregnancy management and help women to enjoy a pregnancy as normal as possible. In women who either conceive on highly active antiretroviral therapy or who don't require this therapy for their own health, there should be a minimum of one CD4 cell count at baseline and one at delivery. In women who commence this therapy, a viral load should be performed two to four weeks after commencing it. At least once every trimester at 36 weeks and at delivery. When pregnant women commence this therapy, liver function tests should be performed as per routine initiation of therapy and then at each antenatal visit. This is because hepatotoxicity may occur because of the initiation of this kind of medication and or the development of obstetric complications such as obstetric cholestasis, preeclampsia, HALP syndrome and acute fatty liver. So in this case it is important to maintain a close liaison with the obstetric team. Now I have a split of pregnancy management between the antenatal, intrapartum and postnatal care we should provide. As we all know, HIV testing of all pregnant women is recommended as long as they accept it. Fetal ultrasound imaging should be performed as per national guideline regardless of maternal HIV status. 
The combined screening test for trisomy 21 is recommended as this has the best sensitivity and specificity and will minimize the number of women who may need invasive testing. Invasive prenatal diagnostic testing shouldn't be performed until after HIV status of the mother is known and should be ideally deferred until HIV viral load has been adequately suppressed. Regarding the mode of delivery, it will depend on women viral load. Previously, they were all recommended to have a cesarean section, although currently they can have a vaginal delivery. This is recommended for women on antiretroviral therapy with viral load less than 50 HIV RNA copies at gestational week 36. For women with a plasma viral load of 50 to 399 at 36 weeks, a C-section should be considered. Where the viral load is more than 400 copies at 36 weeks, C-section is recommended. Where the indication for C-section is the prevention of mother-to-child transmission, C-section should be undertaken at between 38 and 39 weeks gestation. The postpartum period is a critical one. There is an increased risk for postpartum complications. Some studies have suggested that complications due to infection, including fever, endometriosis, wound infection, UTI, and sepsis, are increased. In addition, two reports have suggested an increase in blood loss requiring transfusion or resulting in anemia. Postpartum depression and relapse in drug use are both common. Contraceptive services should be provided. It's important now to have a look at the baby. The neonatal management would include pseudobutyne monotherapy as if this is recommended when there is a very low risk of HIV transmission. On the other hand, infants less than 72 hours old born to untreated HIV-positive mothers should immediately initiate three drug antiretroviral therapy for four weeks. Regarding the infant feeding, we have to remember that HIV can be passed from mother to child through breast milk, so all mothers known to be HIV-positive regardless of Antiretroviral therapy and infant post exposure prophylaxis should be advised to exclusively formula feed from birth. Breastfeeding, while not on antiretroviral therapy or with detectable viremia on antiretroviral therapy, does constitute a potential child protection concern. Therefore, from a salutogenic perspective, our main objective will be to promote normality when treating HIV-positive mothers. Preconception care and preconception counseling is vital in this disease. All HIV-infected women of reproductive age should receive preconception counseling, starting early during HIV care. It should include information about mother-to-child transmission, the importance of maximizing health and minimizing viral load surrounding pregnancy, utilization of antiretroviral therapy, and potential short- and long-term implications of HIV treatment during pregnancy for women and their infants. It also offers the opportunity to advise on safe sex practices and discuss methods to prevent unintended pregnancies. Comprehensive care should be provided. Team approach with coordinated efforts by multiple service providers, including, for example, the community. Antiretroviral counseling, as discontinuation of this therapy can lead to viral rebound with the possibility of in utero fetal infection. Support throughout all stages of pregnancy. As you know, this is really important for us too, particularly paying special attention to the postpartum period to anticipate complications and treat them accordingly. Specific contact with HIV providers should be facilitated during the immediate postpartum period. Finally, this is my reference list. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. See you very soon. Bye!